Welcome to Return to Roots, a mill to bed podcast where the veteran community shares their experiences during transition by narrating their stories and highlighting the resources that shaped their journey to a successful reintegration into the community. Ring the bell to stay up to date and follow us on all social media. Attention, mature audience, listener discretion is advice. Return to Roots Podcast. This week, we bring you Trish, Trisha. Some people call her Trish. Some people call her T. Some people call her Trisha. I like to call her the stressalist. She is a fantastic coach that has been working with the veteran community across the whole United States um, in order to help us when it comes to managing stress and bringing us a different ways and alternatives to be able to cope with that. Without further ado, Trish, welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Yogi. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Excited to be here. Hey, Trish. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show with us and uh, being being awesome enough to be here with the Mill the Vet tribe. Hey, everybody that's listening really quick. All right, you're going to see this little scroller at the bottom. It's going to show you how to connect with Trish. We got our website on there, and we also have our LinkedIn but you know, for uh, the non-audible uh, nice. or non-people yes. that aren't able to see that. Uh, can you tell us how to get a hold of you? Absolutely. That's the best way to get, get, in, get in touch with you. So you can honestly almost throw up a smoke signal. I'll be looking, but... If you can't do that, you can go to stressalist.com, which is the word stress and then A and then list, L-I-S-T. You are welcome to catch me on LinkedIn. Very active on there. Just search my name, Trisha Houghton or stressalist actually is probably also easier. And yeah, I will I will even throw up a phone number at the end. How about that? I love it. Hey, everybody that's listening right now, I want you to hit that like, hit that subscribe button, follow, share with your friends and family that could possibly benefit from the messages that we're going to hear today. Trish, hey, what is one of your favorite books to read while Mm -hmm. you're in a transition? Oh, honestly, I can answer that best at different points in my life, right? Because I'm a person that believes in seasons. And so, um, gosh, so over the time it's changed, but what I would say that, that I like to read, I'm kind of a bit of a nerd. And so, um, the most recent one I have is, um, going through again, I should say is the body keeps the score. However, that is extremely heavy. So, uh, it's pretty dense stuff for something a little lighter. You know, I love things that are just uplifting. Um, give me something that shows me puppies and <laughs> work. <laughs> I kid you not. I deal, with heavy, <laughs> I deal with heavy stuff all day. So, you know, at the end of the downtime, right, I want to laugh. Um, but noise, I have heard, is very good. Any type of gratitude practice, I'm a pretty big fan of that. Just mindfulness in general. And um orienting yourself to your day. I love it. So Trish, you deal with a lot of service members. Uh, You have a lot of background. Um, What, if you could have them go back in time before they joined the military, what advice would you give them in order to them to be successful through their career? I love the question, first of all. And I think what I would say first is remember that at some point when you began, when any of us have begun something new, it is super damn hard. However, you will get to that point where it is not as difficult and you get into a rhythm, right? Um, However, that rhythm is going to change again as short as four years or 35 plus or minus. And you're going to think how slow down because you will have been accompanied or used to the fast pace of the military. So remember that you weren't always at that pace. You adjusted to go into the military and you will readjust if you want to exiting the military. 
see, I think my number one thing people tell me is that they can't sit still. They can't sit still. And um, I've he had people that have mowed their lawn 10 to 15 times in a day. I have, yeah, and a story goes on. And that's at its root, nervous system dysregulation. That's the body's getting too much adrenaline, too much cortisol, too many hormones, basically, that it needed in their former position, but no longer need in that amount. And so, of course, you can't sit down. You're basically stemming with all of these things and it's creating anxiety. It's creating uneasiness. And so um, by puppies, I mean, I've had I've been told it all 40 plants. That was recent. Um, shout out to the 40 plant person. If that's your thing, there's a lot worse. So. That would be my first thing, though, is to remember that you weren't always in the military and you can and you do transition literally every day. Um, one of the things I think we have a danger and potential danger of in the military community is making this transition almost too big. And I don't say that because it's a small transition. Of course, it is not. However, I think sometimes we overstate it. And then it builds up the, oh, man, this is going to be brutal. Right. And so I think we have to be careful to toe that line. And the recent viewpoint I like to come in is, look, every day we transition all day. We transition from morning to afternoon. We transition from afternoon to evening. We transition to bedtime. I mean, literally our days are full of transitions and I'm so not saying that leaving the military is like going from night to day. However, point is you are highly successful in your ability to, to transition and it's not new to you. Um, you've I'm sure had things in your past that yes, were difficult, but you got through it because you're here. Um, this will be another thing that if you continue to tune into your health, and I'll get to that in a minute, and tune into your body, that we better for um, on the other side. It is doable. And I like to remind transitioning service members that it is hard. It is not fun at times. It's grueling. Um, it's stressful. It is so many things. However, the word I want to insert is it's doable. And there's a lot of people that want to support you if you will allow them, but you do have to allow them to be there. So with I love that. that. I love it. I, I love everything that you just said. And I'm just sitting here just writing it all down. And uh, I, I love where you're like, we kind of over hyper extended in the yes. whole entire transition aspect, which I mean, it's a big thing. You got, um, yeah, some uh, identity, identity changings happening. You're not going to be that person anymore, but really you are the same person. It's like, did that uniform really have that much difference? And if it does have that much difference on you, then you're probably doing it all wrong touch that statement. However, <laughs> what I will touch is one of the things I like to say is we take you out of the military, not the military out of you. You are whatever you want to be. And I think as you transition into the civilian life and you aren't kind of over that umbrella Absolutely. anymore and you enter a veteran civilian umbrella, I tell people like, look, it's OK. And I encourage people take an inventory of your values and your culture. Invite your family and say, hey, what do we want our home culture to be like? Because we're not you know, you're starting anew. it's not just you that transitions. It's if you have a family, it's them. If you have a partner, it's them. And so why not ask them, what do we want to create here together? Invite them in on that process and shed what no longer serves you. That's not a bad or wrong thing to do. And I think a lot of the people that I work with kind of have that white knuckling grip on their military career and kind of the potentially, depending on who you are, the, the best days are behind me, right? Like it will never be like it was. It will never be as good as it was. And honestly, here's the thing. The person that says I can do nothing are both Correct. A hundred percent each way. 
So if this is where you peaked, you determine that. Nothing else. Um, there's no thing, there's nothing written in stone that you have to go downhill, right? Or that's life's awful. And of course, I'm being slightly dramatic here for emphasis, but <laughs> but honestly, um, and I can understand it feels ma major, and I'm not saying that it isn't. However, you are capable. And that's the message I like to give is just like other transitions that you've been going through your whole life, um, you're capable of it. And again, there's more and more in our community that want to help and would be happy to listen to you or, you know, help in whatever way that they can point you in the direction of resources. Maybe they can't help, but they know people. I mean, hello, this is why we stress networking, right? Because if you can't help, well, maybe you know someone that can. Oh, and then I have to tell this one thing. I've told it to Yogi, so he knows this one, but the military is going to teach you to tune out. It is going to teach you mission forward, mind over matter, drive forward at all costs, right? No matter what's going on in your body, doesn't matter, mind over the situation. And it's going to do the ignore and override. Now, the only place that that works is in the military. That's the only time in life that it is healthy and necessary. However, guess what we're not doing in the transition space? We're not teaching you, guess what? So you know how you lived your whole life, tuning it out, mind over everything. Guess what? Now we got to flip it. And the rest of your life and the quality of it, and I know that's a big statement, but I stand by it. The quality of it is going to depend on your ability to tune in. And that's in a nutshell, one of the many things that I do. And I think for your transitioning service member, I would encourage you, number one, that while you're learning to tune out, when you have a down moment, tune in, right? So that you're not completely going one way or the other. We want, we want balance. And so that way, when you leave the job one day, you already are so much ahead by practicing just these tuning in techniques that um, that are available. So. With that, I want to pose a question, challenging question, right? You want military members to take some time and tune in, right? Um, I think from our perspective, that can also be very scary and very yes. and very challenging, especially whenever you're deployed, whenever you're oh. going through a lot of things. Right. So what advice would you give to someone that if they right. start looking in, it creates that instead of originally, right? And I do the air quotations right. for a reason because I know for someone that has practiced it, I know that, it, yes, it is scary at first, but afterwards it pays out. It's like going to the gym, right? Your body hurts at first, oh, yeah. but then afterwards it, it moves out. What advice would you give them or how would you relate to them that is so important to be able to face that and, and do that inner listening so that they don't get sm uh, smacked at the end whenever they're getting out of the military like every transitioning member has been doing for a long time mm -hmm. and then they get faced with the fight or flight kind of reaction. Well, I'm going to first say. <laughs> <laughs> I know that was long winded. <laughs> no, no, I'm going back. I'm like, wait, what was the question in there? Um, you're, yeah, right, you're right there. <laughs> so I'm going backwards. The first one was what advice. So you're right. Tuning in can be and often is looked at like this. <laughs> right? right? Nope. No, no, no. Nope. I'm just walling off, right? I'm, I'm not going there. Don't even mess with me. We're not doing this. And I will say this, perhaps tune in when you're not deployed. If that's something you're willing to try first, and here's my recommendation that I give to all veterans, not all, but most, set, I call it the two minute field drill. Set, get in the floor. It doesn't have to be a floor, but just the point is anywhere that's not like there's something in front of you, a screen, right? Or 
email, et cetera. Set your phone or your Alexa or whatever the heck it is to your watch to two minutes. And what I love about this is that there's nothing that I'm asking you to meditate on. There's nothing I'm asking you to conjure up or focus in. I just simply want you in those two minutes to not block anything that comes in. And then when the bell goes off, you're going to get up and you're going to go back to your day. That way, and the reason I designed it, Yogi, that way is exactly why you said. So many of us, military or not, absolutely fear that if we actually feel it, it's going to consume us and we're not going to be able to get out of that pit. I'm here from former experience. Um, this really worked well for me. And I'm not even sure how I adopted it. I'm pretty sure someone told me many more minutes than that. And I was like, <laughs> and look, if it's 30 seconds for you, here's the thing. There's no shame or blame in starting That's the point. And if you are highly triggered, then again, check in with whomever you're working with, your therapist or your counselor or chaplain, whatever it may be, contact me, whatever you want. Um, but the I would only advise is to, I'm not asking you to sit in your feels forever. Because <laughs> here's the awesome part about our body. We are one big muscle memory. You're going to hear me say it a lot. So therefore, when that bell goes off, it's multi-purposed. Number one, it's so you don't get sucked into the hole. Number two, it's so that it literally trains your body internally to stop so that the more you practice it, the more the bell gets associated with kind of stopping your feelings and moving on. So that would be my question in the feels. And honestly, if you don't want to dive into that while you're, again, deployed, I would start with... Um, you know, while you're home, the times you are home, create those two minutes. I tell people I've asked, oh, I'm getting used to the two minutes. Can I increase it? I go, no, do another two minutes, right? So if you were doing your two minutes in the evening and you want to try more, please don't increase the time. Time's important. Add in though, like in the morning or in the afternoon, something like that, so that you're getting, you're still mm -hmm. adhering to the two minutes, but you are increasing time and oh, wow. tuning in. Right. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. So why not increase more time? What's that? Why not increase more time? Why not increase the two minutes? Because number one, we could, but I would have to work, like that would be something I would want to work with you on. Okay. Um, because we're not a healthy culture. We like all, <laughs> we don't like slow increases and <laughs> mediocre, right? Like we go pedal to the metal, especially service members, no offense. And so if I gave you guys open season, you're going to act like it's a competition with yourself. Right. And you're going to just, oh, I think I can do more, right? And you <laughs> lost the point entirely. The point is to tune into you, not race yourself, which we do every day anyways, but I'll leave that rabbit hole alone. But so the point to me is you can still achieve the, remember the objective. The objective is to learn to tune in, not increase time, <laughs> not no, something, right? That is actually on the spot, on the nail on the head, right? Because... You, you said it and you put it in words. I was like, it's not that hard. We can do it, right? But it, you, you're absolutely correct. We would be the first thing that we would do. It'd be like, okay, well, now I'm going to challenge myself to go to five minutes right. and 10 minutes and 30 minutes and so on and so forth. And then you're like, but you're right. We would be missing the point of what that is and what the purpose behind it is. No, thank Yogi, you. hold my beer. Hold my beer, Yogi. I'm going to be drink, in there so you for don't five have beer. minutes. <laughs> oh, love you guys. The uh, that such a great message is to um, sit there and just kind of really listen to your body, you listen to what's going on. And I'm I was sitting there kind of thinking about it, and and I was like, man, my feet really hurt. <laughs> right? Like we really do. If you don't check in, and let's face it, again. You're one big muscle memory. So if you've been the oldest, uh, the seniorest person I've worked with was them for 35 years. 
if you have been in for 35 years, do you think that you're going to know that your feet hurt or Absolutely that your not. chest hurts? Absolutely not. This is why, right? You've gotten so used to that override and that just push through in that three foot world. Like that's it. And so the massive hole that I see is training you guys to tune in as you exit the military, which is a huge thing that I huge is in boastful, but like it's one of my primary yeah. things I love to do for that reason. I don't, I am personally a believer that the second half of your career and or life can be so much better than the first half. However, the quality in it's going to depend on you. It takes effort. It takes maybe even extending a hand to someone and saying, Hey, I don't, I don't know what's going on with this body of mine or the mind or whatever, but you know, whether it's, I can't sit still or I don't feel okay, or I have intrusive thoughts of whatever it is. Number one, you're not alone at all. There's such a mental health stigma still, and I'll leave that soapbox alone. However, you're not alone. There's no weakness in admitting struggles, whether they're mental, physical, emotional, relational, career, whatever, we all have them. And I had a point and I'm not sure what it was. So. <laughs> no, you're good. I just like you know, blow it up in the moment, you know? You know, uh, one thing that is kind of hard for us is that we have this whole entire purpose while we're in, you know, mm, like yep. we have the mission, we have each other, we just have this whole entire sense of accomplishment and brotherhood, sisterhood and belonging and all that stuff. And one thing that's really hard for us is that we feel like we lost our purpose. So what do you think, or in your opinion, mm -hmm. and I know that you deal with a lot of people and finding this, what do you feel is the best way for us to relearn what our actual purpose is? Yeah, I do see this time and time again. I don't think it escapes anybody, to be honest. Even the people that don't necessarily bring it up, you can tell. I mean, I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just, I don't know how you wouldn't have that. You know what I mean? Knowing what I know about the mind and the body and, and history, like it does, it just makes sense. So here's what I'll say first, you create your purpose. So it can't leave you because you leave the military. That's a something to wrap your head around, right? Doesn't just have, and I don't believe we just have one purpose. I believe, as I said earlier, that there's seasons to life. And the military has been a season for you. Has it been a massive one? Absolutely. Has it been a cause you've given yourself to, a community you've given yourself to, support system potentially you've given yourself to? Of course. However, the value you hold, the worth you hold as a human has nothing to do with the military. It doesn't leave you. You have inherent value because you're you. You're one of a kind. And you have special, I believe we all have something special to add to the world. It just looked like it had the face of the military in your most recent past. But you, right, you determine all that. And so I think you remind, again, if you want to hold on to your military community, guess what? There's a huge community of veterans. There's nothing wrong in saying Okay, you know what? Like, it just looks different. So go to your, you know, local veteran meetups or, you know, the VFW, some of those old school things. They exist. There's a whole community. So if you want to stay in that community, just switch to the veteran community. And I promise it's there. Also, I love to have these conversations with people because the number one thing I'm told that people are going to transitioning service members when we're having our chats, if they're talking about their career, I hear project management or IT. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so I'm not trying to knock it, right? I'm, I'm so not, if that would, IT is what gets you up in the morning, let's do that. Keep going. Project management is, again, go for it. However, if it's because that's the two highlighted fields 
that we as a community have focused on because that fits most any military background, please don't do that. Yes. The great news and the not so great news is there's a job for literally almost anything. And guess what? Yes. If it doesn't exist in the civilian world, you get to make it up. right? Yes. Like, you do. And so, but here's what we do. We zoom in, right? And so recently, this is my best, I know this looks silly, but this is my best analogy. When we do this, we lose our peripheral vision of what else is out there. So if you think and you look down, oh my gosh, like I don't, what's my skill set? What am I going to put like ammunition specialist in the, in the civilian space? That doesn't work. And the more we panic and the more we get worried, the more we stress, we lose perspective of what else is around us. But see, you guys train to be resourceful. You train to be smart and to zoom out of situations, to get different vantage points. And you can use that in this moment to benefit you. But again, if you don't perceive it that way, or if you lean on other people, and this is a big red flag I see, you lean on other people to tell you what to do. It's not their life, period. I can have great resources and advice for Joe, but guess what? I'm not Joe. <laughs> If that's not what he wants to do, don't do it. And it makes a ton of sense though, right? And this is why I created a military culture group is because you literally have a culture built on, yes, sir, no, ma'am, yes, sir, right? Like being told what to do and just executing it. Or you've been the one that's told people what to do. And most have been both. Most of the people I've worked with have been on both sides. However, what that does as you transition out is you go, again, muscle memory, what should I do? And you question yourself as the expert on your life because you're used to the orders and you're used to decisions being made, whether you agree with them or not. And that's freaking terrifying on one hand. But the hope that I have is that in working together, that it gets exciting, that it gets curious, that you look at this as a man, what have I always loved to do? What I love to ask people, look, take money off the table for a second. I know we all have to make money. It's a whole riot. However, you take it off the table for a moment. What immediately pops into your head? Doesn't matter what it is. And I always say, allow yourself to not judge yourself. Because a lot of times we block answers that seem silly to the public <laughs> or in I think I lost you. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you so did for a little while. Go, go ahead and uh, just repeat the last 20 seconds. Okay. Let me think for just a second. We're at the end of the week on a Friday. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> keep it real. And that's okay. how you become a millionaire. No. It is. Right? There you go. Woo. Glad we solved that today. Yeah. Uh, no, but seriously. Okay. So what I see many, actually, honestly, every, I can honestly say every service member do is this crisis of self of who am I? What do I want to do? And are those things mutual or separate? <laughs> and that often creates a flight, flight panic response, because again, you've been told what to do, when to do it, how to look, how to behave, how to hold accountability or you've been the one telling those things and usually you've been both. So when it comes time and you all of a sudden get this great big choice you get to make that should be exciting, guess what? It's not. It's just overwhelming. It is. And so what you do instead is you expect Joe to be your expert on your life and what you should do and just, hey, what do I do? Now, let me very much clarify. I am not saying you don't ask people for input or or their thoughts on things, but know that that's what worked for them. And that's what they did. The advice that they give you is advice. It is not something you have to carry through or just blindly say yes to. One of my favorite stories I love with a transitioning service member is he was a young guy, one of my favorite kids today. He's like 22. He comes to me and he 
tells me he's going to just go to school for IT. And I was like, <laughs> do you even like IT? And he goes, no, I hate IT. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, I don't know. You know, because that's what he was told to do. That's where he told he could make money and yep. be use his skill set. So zoom out would be my two thoughts there and take a breath and dream for a minute. You can approach this a few ways, verified and zoomed in and not utilizing your skill set as a soldier or zoomed out using your vantage points differently and going, let me get curious about what's out there. Shoot, Google jobs. If you know you like being outside, Google jobs that are outside. Keep thinking on those other buzzwords, too, because it'll show you different things in Google based on the words. I had someone actually do this this past week, one of my guys. He was like, holy crap, there's so many jobs. That was the criteria, right? Like outside. I was like, yeah. And there's another part now that we, we that, that's what we used to think about, right? Now, if you add something simple, chat GPT or one of the AI tools, oh, it is able to, you, you're literally, literally having a conversation with someone that is impartial, that actually has a lot more knowledge and of everything else that is available. And it allows you to have a impartial, insensitive conversation. And it actually allows you to narrow down more of a um, better understanding of what you want and who you want, right? Uh, I know for a lot of us service members, it is we went into the military for the GI Bill, gives yeah. us opportunities, right? Uh, oh. Also to delay the decision of what, are, what am I going to do when right. I grow what up? What am I going to do when I grow up? Yeah. Right. And then throughout, you know, whether you do two years, whether you do 30 years, right? A lot of us, we're doing it because we're still delaying that answer than delaying it, right? But with that, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, right? The more you actually start preparing as soon as you join the military and start trying to figure that out, the easier this is going to be, yes. right? And just like you said, and I have seen it, right? I have seen it so many times. And one of the one of the funniest parts is, and you you hit, I, you you mentioned it, Trish, is that you ask the person next to you. Mm -hmm. They give you their most up to date and educated answer. However, they haven't gone through a transition. They're still in the military. They have no idea what they're talking about, right? So they are giving you the best answer that they possibly can right. but it's uneducated right and this whole i'm gonna go to school for whatever it's you already delayed it through your military transition you go into school it is another tactic to delay making that decision of what do you want to do right and it is scary it is daunting but once you start doing it once you start peeling back that onion right Right. You know, all, every one of those layers of the onions, there's so many resources out there that actually allows you to figure out what you want to do. I, I started learning, thanks to God and to the creator, whatever we want to call it, um, we were connected to, we were doing this, trying to figure out our lives. Chris was here. We went to a uh, an event in the USS Midway, and a whole bunch of recruiters showed up teaching us about what they did the, the the market and it was a nonprofit right. thing event you know it was it was a great thing i did not go in there part of me went in there with the uh well i could get a job out of one of these people right they should know they should be able to teach me right but the reality of those things happening was one in one in a thousand right maybe more right but what i'm getting at is every thing that you do every person you talk to is an opportunity what you make with that opportunity is entirely up to you right everybody talks about networking 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 right talking to any person any human being is networking making that connection it is networking right some people consider networking a dirty word because it's another way of well i'm Hey, Trish, I'm just connecting with you because you have something that I want and I want you to give it to me. Well, how about uh, 
I'm Trish. How about that? We become friends. Right. Maybe. Okay. How about we get to know each other? Just like you said, maybe I hate IT. Right. Right. And okay. you are an IT. And then that's all you have to offer. So, of course, I'm not going to like your mindset because it doesn't line up with me. Right. But yeah. if we start finding out what we like or what we don't like and who we like and who we don't like, and maybe the people that we like, we're like, hey, what do you do? How do you do it? Maybe I like this field. Maybe I like, I just like the people that you hang out with. What do you do? How do you do it? How can I become that? Right? And then put it into ChatGPT or Google or whatever. Uh, if people still use Skype, you know, use Skype. <laughs> Is it still out there? Oh, my God. I guess. It, I say that because I did have to deal with somebody that was Skype me. I was like, oh. wait, that's still around? That thing exists? Okay. And it was a nightmare to log in. Oh my, yeah, it always was. But, you know, either way, neither here nor there. But no, I mean, it is that right. simple. Right now, while we were talking, I put in there, um, give me a mindset of, or give me a couple jobs. Yep. And it pulled out 80 jobs. Yep. Right? I'm not going to read what 80, 80 of those jobs are. Maybe I'll, I'll read the first three or five, but I'll, I'm like, hey. Remove this, remove that, and you start having that conversation, and, and it is so much easier. But no, no, that's awesome, Trish. Thank you so much for sharing that. If you couldn't tell, I got a little excited about that answer. No, I love it. No, that that's uh, I love every aspect that you just talked about, and it's kind of going into the next question that I'd love to ask, mm -hmm. and that is a transitioning mindset. How do you get into a transitioning mindset? And I'm gonna talk about it from your perspective because i've seen that you've made quite a few different transitions career-wise and how did you go from i mean i i see counselor i see swim coach i see uh, all these different uh aspects what was it that helped you get into that transitioning mindset to spin it and then get to where you're at today so oh man it's been different roads and I can say, here's the thing, knowing what you don't want is just as important as knowing what you do want. If you can start with a list of I don't want to's, start there. Literally. If you know you don't want to do deal with money, no finance, right? <laughs> if you know you don't want to have a nine to five, okay, then we're going to have to get a little creative, but doable, right? If you want a nine to five, which is the most common thing I hear, and you just want to do get in and get out, totally get that. Again, so number one, just knowing what you do or, or knowing what you don't want is just as important as that. And so I say that because I knew originally, so I originally went to school because um, two things. One, I had a, a substance abuse history of my own, but also I really wanted to specialize in that. However, well, and at the same time, I grew up with 9-11 and I've always clicked with veterans. It's never been work for me. And so, and I've never loved the lack of mental health or shoot, even physical health care. I can't stand the lack of access for marginalized populations especially for whatever reason, uh, veterans. And so I knew I would be here one day. I didn't know the how, I didn't know the when, I didn't know the where, right? All that remained a mystery. Um, but I did one step at a time and I knew I needed a degree to do substance abuse and work with that population. So I started there. From there, I, I fell in love with crisis work. Learned, I actually thrive in fight flight. So... <laughs> So that's a good thing. And also it turned into a not so good thing um, because that's what brought me out of the career was my fight flight got stuck in the on position. I did not know that could happen, which is exactly what I told the doctor. Is that a thing? How is that a thing? That's probably about what I said. It sounded super intelligent. <laughs> so, but it, it, when I stopped and I, I had a massive crash. So for instance, it's called nervous system dysregulation. And this is what I specialize in. 
So essentially what that is, is your body has been in basically a constant state of fight flight. It has lost the ability to turn on and off, which is what most people have happened right? You get, again, your age old scenario of if a bear is chasing you, let, let's have fight flight. Let's do it. Give me the hormones, the adrenaline. <laughs> let's run. It was never made to flip on and off. And when you go into a high stress career or high performance career, it's like a light switch that you go into a room 50 to 75 times or more a day. And that over time, creates issues. I mean, goodness gracious, what happens even if you turn the same, flip the switch in your, let's just say in your bedroom, right? Eventually what happens to the bulb? It can't last that. And the more you leave it on, the sooner it burns out. So essentially nervous system dysregulation, like I said, is getting that fight flight stuck because of overuse and it, your body's just so used to it. That's its default. So you never actually enter rest. And therefore, the body takes hits. The mind takes hits. Um, actually, neurologically, your brain works differently. Um, things such as brain fog and what I can only describe as bone tired. Um, when I had my nervous system crash. And like I said, it was a very abrupt thing. As we wrap up this compelling episode of Return to Roots, a heartfelt reminder echoes through our conversation. If you or someone you know is facing challenges, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24-7. Dial 988. Your life is important and the help is just a call away. And before we sign off, a special mention for our transitioning service members. Explore the MYTT 365 app, a valuable resource tailored to support you on your journey from the military to civilian life. With guidance, community, and tools, it is here to make your transition smoother. Remember, you are not alone. Take that courageous step forward. Thank you for being with us on Return to Roots. Stay strong, stay connected, and always move forward. Support the Milk Vet community by hitting that like button and subscribing for more engaging content. Ring the bell and stay connected. Stay updated following us on all of our social media platforms. 